project that uh, construction took place during the years of 2018-2019. Uh, we wrapped up the financial components and, and some miscellaneous uh, cleanup type work in 2020. Uh, but the, the, uh, the project, again, uh, should be relatively familiar to everybody. Um, what you see here, with every item, we've got a summary of the project. This isn't meant to go into any great detail. Uh, prior documentations that we've submitted uh, to the City Commission during the uh, review and approvals of the project are certainly available if, if uh, more detail is needed. Uh, after a brief description of the project, I do identify the attachments that are going to be included with this particular uh, packet, a staff recommendation, a quick discussion on the policy, a summary of the financial uh, information which is included in the resolutions directing assessment to be levied that the City Commission passed back in March. And then to conclude, the uh, report, if you will, is a timeline of not only the um, City Commission approvals and prior actions taken on the job, but um, a handful of uh, public involvement opportunities are identified in here as well, just to give the assessment commissioners an idea of uh, you know, the communications that have taken place throughout the, the course of the project. Again, Chiantry being uh, our largest project, at least in, in the time I've been involved with Fargo, I am pretty sure people are familiar with, with uh, the activities that took place. So, jumping back to the beginning, uh, I, I don't intend to read through all of these. This will be, uh, in my intent with this entire packet, you can see there are 227 pages, is to make this available online, uh, pending any changes that we need to make after tonight's meeting. And that goes for every uh, district that's, that's listed here in today's tonight's agenda. So, uh, I don't want to turn this into a, a very lengthy meeting and, and certainly don't want people falling asleep, so I'm not going to go through and read word for word. Um, but the, the gist of Cheyenne Street Project, of course, we, we reconstructed it, turned it in uh, from a two-lane rural asphalt road section to a, um, an urban concrete section, uh, beaten drive down to 32nd, is of course six lanes, and then from 32nd Avenue down to 40th, it's a four-lane section. Uh, both segments did include underground work such as storm sewer and other uh, utilities relating to sanitary sewer and water main uh, improvements. And along with the streets, of course, we um, other enhancements uh, include multi-use paths, uh, street lighting, um, so on and so forth, to really, um, again, address the, the capacity needs that we uh, were experiencing over the last several years due to our rapid growth of the interstate. So uh, really the, the project was geared at not only um, making certain uh, traffic adjustments to accommodate the, the growing capacities that we, that we were experiencing, but enhance safety, uh, not only vehicle safety, but pedestrian safety were really a focal point of this project. The um, efforts really started, I, I would say, kicked into high gear back in 2014 when Metrocog uh, commissioned a, a corridor study using state dollars. We had um, multiple participation involved with this uh, study. And you can see here um, that was starting around 2014, and the study concluded in 2016. You can see here, underneath this previously presented information and commission actions, um, this study really took a look at design alternatives, um, weighed options, started looking at high-level cost estimating. Of course, this project is receiving federal funding, so we were really trying to not only um, figure out what, in, what is the best, best interest of this corridor, but getting some early snapshots of what these costs were going to be, not only from a, um, a city fund perspective, but also from a special assessment perspective. And I recall early on in some of these uh, initial public meetings that we had in, in 2015 and 16, uh, we were even trying to advertise what a range of an assessment could be. Uh, don't quote me, but I, I believe uh, one of the early ranges that we provided was $2,500 to $4,000 for an average residential uh, property. So, once 
that uh, corridor study completed and we identified several alternatives, we did identify uh, some preferred options to move forward into uh, what I would consider the environmental and preliminary design phase. And through the environmental and preliminary design phase is where we really start to hash out um, those preferred options in terms of um, our, what are those impacts going to be, you know, the social and economic impacts, the um, typical and standard environmental impacts. And this is all a requirement when you're using federal funding to go through this process. And so um, over the next year or two, we really had uh, a lot of effort put into, again, analyze what we were preferring to move forward with. And this is taking place prior to getting into the final design. And so over the course of 2016 and 2017, as we went through that process, again, there was uh, additional public outreach activities where we could uh, take in public comments. There were um, uh, presentations to the city commission in terms of what options to move forward with. For example, the interchange had uh, three major design um, alternatives. The city commission decided to go forward with what's called a modified single urban uh, interchange. So um, along with that, that is where the city commission decided to go with the six-lane section from Beaton Drive down to 32nd. They also decided to only go with the four-lane section from 32nd to 40th. Um, the corridor study that was done in, in, in 2014 through 16 actually recommended a six-lane section all the way down to uh, 40th Avenue. So those are the kinds of, again, I'm just trying to paint a picture of all of the effort that went in prior to getting to even the final process and certainly prior to uh, starting construction. So. so um, moving along the timeline, once we started making those decisions at a commission level, you can see here uh, June 19th commission had a discussion on design alternatives. September 5th is really when the city commission created the improvement district. October 16th, City Commission approved an engineer's report. November 9th, final documented categorical exclusion document, which is the culmination of that environmental and preliminary design process. That was sent to the DOT back in November of 17. Shortly after, the City Commission approved plans and specifications and authorized uh, staff to go forward and advertise bids. And of course, April 16th, City Commission awards a contract for Segment 2. November 15th, City Commission awards a contract for Segment 3. So that really takes us up to the construction process. Moving beyond this now, I'm going to start going through some of these attachments that are going to be included here. And I'm just going to read through them real quick just for everybody's, uh, especially the public's sake. There's going to be a district boundary map. A re the resolution directing investments to be levied, that's what was issued by the City Commission back in March, establishing that final dollar amount. I'll have some sample construction plans, photos, and we're going to get into really the meat of the purpose of our Special Assessment Commission. We're going to go through a benefit methodology map, is, is what I've termed it here. That's where we're going to talk about how we are going to allocate the dollar amount the City Commission set forth in that resolution directing acceptance to be levied. So we're going to do that with a, a nice graphic map. Um, there will be a, a draft assessment list and allocation, uh, or a draft assessment allocation map, along with the corresponding list that goes with that. So getting into those attachments, you can see here the assessment district that was created includes all the parcels south of the interstate. This is been our uh, philosophy over the last several years when we do an arterial roadway reconstruction. So 32nd and 40th Avenues, east and west. Those projects were, again, assessed over this same boundary. I should stop there. Any questions on the assessment district boundary before I move on? Uh, yeah, I got one. Um, so last year when we were looking at the uh, Cheyenne Street from 13th on a beaten, mm -hmm. uh, the assessment district stopped at 13th Avenue. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what the, what the reason was here that 
didn't stop it for you. Sure. So consistency gets to be a big thing. And unfortunately, on the north side of town, the improvement boundaries have been different than what has taken place on the south side of town. So like I said, with 40, 32nd and 40th Avenue East Reconstruction, that was District 2233, uh, that, that um, took place about five years ago. And then 32nd and 40th Avenue West, District 2239, that took place in you know, a few years ago where those districts used the same boundary. And there was a meeting with the Special Assessment Commission prior to that as to the philosophy moving forward as we do the arterial roadway work on the south side of town. And at the time, that Special Assessment Commission agreed to uh, break this boundary for all arterial projects. On the north side of town, that precedent got set much sooner. You know, there's been decades worth of work on that side. So on the north side of town, there has been a little more of a, again, it's not exact for every single project, but traditionally, like Main Avenue, the boundary went up to the railroad tracks and then down to 7th Avenue. And so when we looked at 13th, we went to 7th Avenue. And then miles off that, the idea was to try to limit the number of arterial assessments to the residents to just one east-west, one north-south. If I had a map of that north side of town, I could show you how it is based on the, just the geographical shape of it. It's difficult to hold true to that on every scenario, but that's why the difference. So again, on the south side of town over the last um, five, six years, seven years, we've been creating a, a boundary like this for all of our material work. So I, I can maybe shed some light on that also. The reason was that the area south of 52nd uh, was deemed to benefit from Cheyenne, the expansion of Cheyenne, because all of the traffic, you know, it's a major, major street throughout the community that collects all that traffic from the south of 52nd in the wild, uh, 10th through like 21st edition, and that head north, and so that's why it was included within the district. And uh, historically, a lot of the, the districts south of the interstate have been much larger because the improvements have come so much quicker. Uh, over time, most of the south side of the community is brand new infrastructure. And so it's been you know, fairly, the road like 32nd came in very quickly, the expansion, 40th came in quickly. And so that's where the kind of the genesis of how the southern part of the community has been treated. Whereas in the north end, it's uh, north of the interstate. It's a little doesn't piece of infrastructure development hasn't been as fast as the south end. Any other questions? I don't have any questions. I have some thoughts, but I'll keep myself right now. So <laughs> thank you. Okay. So the next attachment, the resolution directing assessment to be levied. This is what the city commission passed. Um, in the first week of March. The amount to be assessed for this district is 32270000 So that is the amount that is given to the Assessment Commission now to allocate out. The next uh, several attachments here are just going to try to help visualize the, the project itself, you know, the location and, and what it entailed. You can see here again, uh, Beaton Drive is the north boundary of this clouded area here, includes um, all of the work done to 40th Avenue, um, like I mentioned, segment two, it was a separate contract that started at uh, construction in 2018, segment three, that last mile there from 32nd down to 40th, started construction in the uh, spring of 19. So again, two different construction projects all underneath the same district. This next slide here, just a cover sheet for the plans that were um, created for segment two. The um, interchange work is included with segment two. Of course, the funding scheme, uh, the city's portion was small in comparison to the total project, but there was um, a city portion of that work done too that was included with the overall cost of, of District 2250.
So here's a photo taken near uh, near Beaton Drive, looking south. I'm oh, sorry, it's on the south side of the interchange, looking north. You can see here the, the new Hornbachers. Um, along with the roadway work, it's hard to see in this picture, but this section here, if you can see the cursor moving, that is where a new stormwater pumping station was constructed as a part of the project as well. So uh, that pr primarily picks up a lot of the drainage that occurs within the, the interstate and, and street, the Shine Street corridor. And just another graphical view. Uh, one thing to maybe note on this one, again, with all the interchange, as you move south of the interchange, we did have to expand the, our bridge over the diversion channel. Again, to accommodate the six lanes. And of course, getting uh, down to 32nd Avenue is uh, the end of segment two. This next cover sheet is the, uh, or the next sheet here is the cover for the segment three plan set. Again, segment three went down to just, just a few hundred feet south of 40th Avenue. to demonstrate again I'm sure you've all been on the, on the roadway but from 32nd to 40th is a four lane section road. Um, the entire corridor here now has uh, multi-use paths on each side making the uh, pedestrian movements not only safer but um, prior to this project they didn't exist at all. So uh, when we were going through the corridor study process there was a video shared with the city commission uh, of a bike uh, bicyclist navigating this corridor and almost getting hit by a car on a couple of different occasions. So um, I can't stress enough that this project not only enhanced the, the, uh, the capacity for the vehicles and safety for the vehicle traffic, but also uh, certainly a lot of pedestrian safety improvements and, and uh, just um, adding those facilities is, is very critical uh, for the south side residents. Okay. So after going through some of that, are there any questions as to the project entails, the scope of work, uh, anything relating to construction, design, any, any of that that can help? Just, uh, the, the important part here is, is before we get into how we're going to allocate out the cost that the city commission gave you, is to make sure you have a good thorough understanding of what the improvements consist of. So um, if you feel like we're missing some things in here, we can certainly add them before we publish them. Um, but again, I'm just going to ask, are there any questions relating to the scope of the work? Justin, did you have a chance to cover that little neighborhood that we had in for that, for like access paving? Oh, I didn't. Um, it's, a good, it's a good point. I can zoom in right here. There was a portion of work, uh, so there, there actually is a, another contract that was left for a hundred and Again, don't quote me on this, but 150 or so thousand dollars um, for some access improvements in this existing neighborhood here. This is Kensington Drive, where they pre previously had a full access onto Cheyenne Street. The urbanization forced them into a reduced access situation. So I'm hovering with this cursor here. Their access was limited to just a right out only. And in doing so, we came through with an improvement project to open up an access. This was previously a cul-de-sac, a dead-end cul-de-sac. So um, residents would come in here, get as far as they needed to, turn around and come back out to Diane Street. Now there is a connection. The cul-de-sac was removed. The connection made over to the uh, adjacent street here where there is a full access on 38th. The, um, th that not only improve their access, but for emergency services to have that second point to get out is certainly uh, beneficial. Uh, but again, uh, the, the, the need really was driven by the design of Cheyenne Street limiting or restricting their access from a full to a right out only. So that's where um, there was a decision made by the city commission. We went forward with that improvement not to special assess those residents anything more um, for those improvements but to include all that cost with the entire district as a whole uh, simply because again it was the urbanization of Cheyenne Street that took away the access that they previously had so 
Uh, there will not be, as you'll see when we go through the methodology here, there will not be a separate assessment allocated to these residents for that cost. That is included as an overall project cost. Thanks for pointing that out, John. Absolutely. Yes, and originally it was meant to be included with the segment three construction work. Um, we did peel back. If I went to the uh, back to the summary sheet here, we ended up pulling out of the segment three project because we wanted some additional time to meet with those residents. I believe that's identified in here. So, yeah, May 30th of 2017, there was a public input meeting specifically with the Windsor Green neighborhood on their access options. We also then presented op options to um, upgrade the city sewer and water, so on and so forth. Uh, I didn't administrate those meetings. Uh, public Works was engaged with it at that time. So I don't have all the specifics, but I do know that we had not only one meeting, but there were other outreach opportunities and op um, options to send in a vote on certain um, aspects of, of what we were doing up here. Ultimately, we ended up with about a $150,000 project, which did not include individual sewer water services. All of that went away. We just focused on opening up that cul-de-sac or connecting that cul-de-sac to the street to the north so that they had additional access. So I'm going to move forward into the benefit methodology now. So here we not only have a nice um, visual representation of, of how we're allocating the benefit, but I do, on the, um, or at least I thought we did, there would be a report that went along with this. So here we go. Skip ahead. So before I get to the nice visual map, let me just briefly read here. So again, the uh, summary of location improvements, we went through that. Uh, the, you know, all properties on the interstate, regional benefit. The street project is going to be what we're proposing. And again, this is a proposal. This is what we're proposing here. We're open for discussion and comment. Uh, but what we're proposing is to allocate the assessments on an equivalent unit basis. That is uh, fairly consistent with our special assessment policy. Our, our assessment policy was adopted back in September of 2016. Um, as an arterial roadway, it provides a regional benefit, and we're proposing to allocate it for an equivalent unit or with an equivalent unit basis. Uh, this includes the entirety of the work being assessed under the project. So I, I stress that because, again, of situations like the Kensington Drive work, um, there is no part of this project that we carve out that we are allocating to one particular area more than another. This is $32,270,000 being assessed over an equivalent unit basis. So uh, there, are, there were some utility stubs provided in the certain areas. And again, the reasoning for that is as we urbanized this corridor, we didn't want to lose sight of the opportunity to have cross connections made. Um, but it wasn't meant to, um, you know, for example, we didn't run an individual service lines into a house that that service line only benefits that house. We made some, I would, I would call, responsible decisions to make sure that when we are done here a few years from now, we don't have to rip through the road for a utility connection that might need to be served for uh, unserved areas. So, for example, McMahon Estates, South River Estates, Carmel Place, uh, some of these areas that are existing residential areas that currently don't have city sewer water, we wanted to make sure that we did provide connection stubs, if you will, far enough away from the roadway so that these areas can tie on in the future. But we didn't track that cost individually and assess those neighborhoods individually. We, again, um, are proposing that that's just part of the nature of, of doing a project like this, and that's part of an overall project cost. So again, I just want to make sure that that's clear. Um, that it's, it's a simple 
was this. All of that $32,370,000 is being allocated on equivalent unit basis. The purpose of the map now, it, it just helps to, I don't know why I skipped ahead here quite a bit. The purpose of this map is to help visualize um, how the methodology is being spread. This would make a little more sense with some of these other districts where they, we have several different buckets that we are tracking and allocating differently. For example, some projects will have storm sewer by a square foot, water main by a front foot, so on and so forth. Uh, some projects have 9 to 12 buckets. A visual map like this helps that. But again, for 2250, we're proposing just to assess all of the properties here on an equivalent unit basis, and now it's the um, number of equivalent units will certainly change by property. And what we have currently in our special assessment policy, again, that was adopted in 2016, is that all residential properties under two acres that are platted and developed will receive one equivalent unit, or a maximum of one equivalent unit. So if there's a, a, a 1.8 acre property in um, Twin Meadows addition, it will still get one equivalent unit. That same policy goes on to say that for properties over two acres that are developed and platted, they will get one equivalent unit for the first two acres, but then an additional 0.1 equivalent unit per 0.1 acres after that. So for example, a 2.2 acre property in Twin Meadows subdivision would get 1.2 equivalent units. Is there any questions on that? I want to make sure that that's okay. And again, that's been consistent with how we've been allocating our assessments since at least that policy was adopted in September of 16. Uh, commercial and, and multiple family lots, we don't, again, historically have not treated them any different aside from the fact that now a two acre parcel for you know, multifamily or commercial, that two acre parcel will get multiple equivalent units, whereby we set one equivalent unit equal to 10,000 square feet, or another, you know, in rounding terms, one equivalent unit, or one acre would be equal to four and a half equivalent units. Did the math there. So, again, that's how we've been doing it. There's a lot of alternative options and discussions to have on that, but what I'm proposing is to stay consistent with how we've treated equivalent units in the past. Um, and again, this would be no different. There, um, again, are several different types of uses in here, but predominantly we are dealing with a residential use, uh, a multifamily use, a commercial use, or agricultural use. We're not worrying about the use for just equivalent unit is more or less an area wide or an, an area calculation type assessment. There are, um, there is one other type of property that I want to bring up, and it's condos. And again, we've dealt with condo areas in the past, and we are treating these the same. But a townhouse development, there is a section in the Century Code on this. A townhouse development, the Century Code tells us to basically take that area of that townhouse development, any of the common spaces that are there, shall be measured accordingly and redistributed back to the benefiting parcels that use that common space. So to make that a little less um, confusing, if, if you have a condo association where there's 20 different units on, say, three acres, but those units are really only on one acre, there's two acres worth of common space, whether it's a parking lot or a green space or a pickleball court, we track all of that area and put it onto those 20 condos. The idea there is that we're not losing then a lot of area from the assessment district. We're trying to, again, make sure that the majority of this area is assessed out um, in that matter. 
And again, that's what um, we're trying to identify here with this map. It does show there's a legend here that shows where we, this map today says condo properties, but again, we're really, um, you know, those commons based type areas. So we also identified lots, residential lots that are over two acres. So you can see pretty quickly where that is occurring. Again, these lots are getting more than one equivalent unit. They're following that policy. There's not a whole lot of them here, but um, predominantly there's a handful in, in pretty much all of Nelson Acre subdivision, and then there's a handful of residential properties that have recently been platted along Sanchez too. So. Also identified, there are some uh, properties in here, West Fargo Parks, West Fargo City properties. I uh, just wanted to make sure that we're identifying those. There, you know, park facilities, depending on the situation, park facilities are certainly subject to special assessments, just like the city parcels are. It just, again, it would depend on the use of that particular parcel. Uh, for example, the city stormwater retention pond property, we're not going to allocate an assessment to. Um, but if it, um, you know, for example, if it was a thing on the type of district, if it was a local street and a list station had a connection to that local street, we would assess that city parcel, say, for a foot assessment. Um, I, I don't know uh, in detail every single parcel here and how it's being assessed, but that's where this information is available to, to reference. Um, so moving past the, the methodology again, identifying those, those parcels and calculating the equivalent units. And in doing so, this next map here um, was meant to, again, be a visual representation of how the assessments are, are shaking out based on that allocation method. So uh, you can see here we just set up a scale you know, through GIS, using GIS, the um, the bottom line number here, this 3,300, I believe, is equal to one equivalent unit. So that's where the majority of properties, single-family residential properties, are going to get that one unit. They're shaded blue. Anything between 3,000 and 15,000 is going to have a little different shade of blue, so on and so forth. The red shaded parcels are, of course, now where the majority, you know, those parcels are getting more than a million dollar assessment. So, for example, West Fargo Public Schools owns the property here. This is where Cheyenne High School and Liberty Middle School are located. Um, I mentioned the Park District before. Rendezvous Park here, over a million dollars. So, again, I don't want to... There's a lot of parcels in here, so... You know, we could spend a lot of time going parcel by parcel, but um, again, this is meant to be a good visual uh, in terms of representing how these assessments are, are being allocated. So I will mention that on the north side of the map here, it is truncated, so there is an inset located in the lower left corner, or lower right corner here. So these properties would be the very northernmost part. Now after the map, is a parcel by parcel list. So this is the preliminary assessment list that we are asking you to approve tonight based on the methodology that I have posed. So if there are any uh, changes made to the methodology, that will, of course, reflect into a change necessary to be made on this list. So for example, if we um, want to add a front footage assessment to this district. We can certainly go back and do so. This list has to be modified and changed. So now this list here is about 70 pages long. There are, I think, over 5,000 parcels, so I, I'm not going to go page by page on this by any means. I think what I will do now is uh, pause to, to see if there are are any discussions, questions, comments on the methodology itself? Again, I'm gonna, just gonna zoom into the written part here just to reiterate the fact that the um, entire project cost is being assessed over an equivalent unit basis. That is, yes, 
That is correct. Now, there, there, some of the parcels might have changed. You know, so if, if a non-platted parcel became platted, Salt River Estates come to mind. Salt River Estates was, at the, at, for districts 2233 and 2239, I don't believe they were platted. Now they are, so they meet the, that policy on the two acres. But the same equivalent unit for all costs, for the most part, is correct. I, I do believe that those projects did have a couple of side costs that were tracked and spread over certain parcels. Otherwise, the majority of that cost was assessed over equipment unit basis for both districts got notified that um, we need all of you, three of you up there, to turn on your microphones and talk into your microphones because we can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that.
again, I don't necessarily have, you know, a solution for this, but, you know, maybe when you guys do something, I don't know, but it's just something I want to bring up and just consider, or, you know, just bring up the, it's a certain, because we want to make this as fair as possible for everybody, so, absolutely. What would be in the? You know, we're using area budget. Right. What would be an alternative basis for allocations for apartment building? Yeah, I don't know if there's. Now, if we have, you know, if we're able to use some kind of multiplier or something, you know, I don't know. There's, you know, I'm not looking at, you know, those, you know, I'm not looking to change policy tonight or anything like that. But it's just, it's, these are things been thinking about. You know, here over the last couple of years that, you know, they always go through my head. And I'm always going to ask these questions, looking at these, looking at these assessments. So. Absolutely. And um, I said this a while ago, but we have the same thoughts that go through our head. There's many different ways to, to, to give you assessments. There isn't, you know, quite honestly, um, I didn't go to school to figure out how to allocate assessments. It's probably the first part of my job is this special assessment world. Um, but because our uh, century code dictates that the city engineer shall provide a recommendation on allocating, um, I am involved in, and of course, with every project, I question other, you know, other ways to do it. One, I don't want to get into the multitude of them, but another one would be, you know, do we use the trip generation account? So depending on your land use, we go to the ITE manual, figure out what the trip generation is, a single family lot actually. Um, produces more of a trip generation than an apartment building per size. So one single family resident, residential property generates 10 trips per day. One unit in an apartment building is six trips per day. Again, just don't quote me on those numbers, but in rough, just for discussion purposes, and there is a table with a multitude of types of uses, and you could maybe go to something like that. And there's a lot of other options here. But I, what I have learned in the time that I've been doing this is when you get on the one, somebody can sit in the background and throw darts at that one. And you can move on to another one. What about this idea? And you can throw darts at that one as well. Um, and I hope that someday we get to one that there is, it, there's no more darts coming. We, I hope someday we find the perfect solution. I will say that for me, I will err on consistency with prior districts. And so, um, like Commissioner Brown brought up, with the recent arterial roadway projects, districts 2233 and 2239, followed the equivalent unit being equal to 10,000 square feet type methodology. Uh, but again, you could, you could compare our land use map to those trip generation tables. But the day someone comes out here and, and applies for a land use amendment at the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, do they approve it, knowing that that would alter how we would assess them or not? You know, there's, again, you could, uh, yeah, so I don't disagree that there are other ways to do it. I'm certainly open, and I hope someone finds a solution that works for everybody. But what I've learned is that there's not a solution that works for everybody. We've had projects in the past that, um, quite frankly, have been assessed at a much lower rate than very similar projects in other areas. And so, again, I, you know, it's just those are the the pitfalls of special assessments, I guess, but um, until I'm told not to fund projects with special assessments I, and, and until I'm given a, another methodology, um, I'm going to try to err on being as close as I can to prior districts. And again, I'll caution that every district has its unique challenges. A project like 9th and 13th Avenue, where you have an intersection improvement that touches a lot of different people, and you start getting into the geographical confines of our city with the border that comes one mile in, two miles out, one mile back, it gets difficult to be very black and white for every improvement district. And an intersection is much different than a 9th Street itself. 13th Avenue is much different than an I Street to begin with. The types of properties in there. So again, so on and so forth. So yes, I, I don't want to keep rambling on on that, but I agree there are certainly several other ways to consider allocating, and I've chosen to be as close as, as 
we've done for other our hero projects. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, to go from an area calculation to some sort of use generation calculation, I mean, it certainly could be done, but it would take an awful lot of research to find a fair and equitable use calculation, right. whether it be chips, trip generations or number of vehicles. I mean, it's, it's to be fair, I'm not aware of any city that uses a use generation as a basis of allocating special assessments. It would be interesting to find out if somebody did. In the apartment buildings that are challenged when it comes to transportation improvements, uh, typically, you know, the theory, I'll give you the theory behind assess, a street assessment for an apartment building is that it's almost easier if you have a toilet uh, or for water because then you can allocate it per unit. You can identify an account with the assessment. With apartment buildings, the challenge is you have a vacancy rate on the overall apartment building. And older apartment buildings typically have a higher vacancy rate than newer apartments. Uh, and then on top of it, typically the people who live within apartments are either at the, at the ends of the spectrum, they're either older folks or younger folks, so they don't have a lot of school-age children. So you don't have the trip generation by the school bus, and those, and they typically have fewer vehicles. Uh, you get to a single family home, you see a lot more vehicles per home. And so we've, when we look at the equivalent unit, it's, you could certainly apply some factor to an equivalent unit for an apartment building. Uh, I would, wouldn't want to throw out something tonight without doing a whole lot of research. And then you're going to have, as Dustin said, you're always going to have people who throw darts at the theory and say, well, my apartment building has a much higher vacancy rate than that apartment building. Everybody who's in my apartment building, I'm speaking as the owner of the apartment building, uh, they're older, they don't have cars, they just take public transportation. Well, it's certainly a good discussion for a future time. But right now, a use is not in our, our special assessment policy manual. No. So, I mean, okay. these districts that are out there today, we don't have an option. We have to use the one that's in the manual. Right. And those are all area-based calculations. So we're kind of involved. We do, the commission researches it. All those other options are kind of stuck using what we've got before. So. And, um, Mr. Chair, to the, to the consistency, everything that's south of the interstate with the new infrastructure, this has been the standard with some, some deviations on the end of the spectrum for special properties. This is typically been the standard assessment formula. It's been the same for the north side as well, correct? I'd have to, I don't know that off the top of my head. I'd have to defer to Dustin. Yeah. When it comes to calculating what an equivalent unit is, yes, mm -hmm. for regional roadway projects. Now, we have had other types of improvement districts, a stormwater improvement district, where we identify a different unit, if you will. Right? So, but for the sake, for the purposes of this, and according to our policy, there is a section in there, again, on arterial roads and what the equivalent unit is, and so we have to follow this path mm -hmm. on the north side of the route. The boundaries have been different methodology there, but... And just for this district now, our equivalent unit is about $3,300. And yeah, right now it is 33.79.66, and I can certainly uh, get to the bottom of this spreadsheet, whereby and you can see there there's 70 some pages, if I recall. Just want to confirm.
those units into that total dollar amount yields the cost per equivalent unit would be $3,379.66. Mr. Scott, you had mentioned uh, something about utility stove costs being included in here. Do we have uh, an approximate of what that total was for that? Total between all of them? No, I, I really don't. Um, certainly something I could research and, and try to um, provide either at a later time if we didn't want to make an action on this. Because of that, that can certainly look to that number. I don't have it on top of my head. There are other uh, materials that are, again, available on the website, um, which is, again, I mentioned that in the cover sheet here. As I list out the attachments, right after that, additional project information provided on the website. So there, um, if you click on that link, it takes you to all these projects. Again, maybe the question that you're looking for is maybe not in here, but it's just, I just want to reiterate that there are additional documents on the website to reference. Um, so things like a detailed engineer report or, um, you know, the resolution directing assessment will be, you know, pretty, pretty much whatever would have been approved by the city commission throughout the process. We tried to get it in here. Um, there might be some things missing, but for the most part, if it's not in this packet, it's either available on the website, and if it's something beyond that, we can certainly, um, on a case-by-case -case basis, provide additional information where needed. Any other questions? I don't have any more questions. I think, you know, the consistency with what we've done in the past, I think, is you know, that information is helpful, so. Two gentlemen, do you have any, that have sat for an hour of this back for that one? Any questions? Okay. Well, I've got a uh, motion. Make a motion to approve District 2250. I'll second that. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carried. Thank you. Okay, that's one. Let's get back to number one, then. Very good. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. So, uh, the next item here that I'll go through is for Sewer Water Storm and Street Improvement District 1321. It is associated with the Wilds 11th edition. Uh, the Wilds South 52nd Avenue is a multi-phase development uh, that really started back in 2015. And the uh, Wild 7th edition uh, was platted. Improvements were um, extended into, into that subdivision. Uh, as that neighborhood started to mature, uh, not only local improvements, but regional improvements are, are necessary to uh, provide all of the, the city infrastructure. So when we do have um, a project like this, which I do want to stress that, you know, this usually starts with the developer filing a petition with the city to have local improvements extended in to the, subdiv to the subdivision. Um, we, uh, again, are, are looking at not only those local improvements, but again, those regional uh, needs. So things like a collector roadway. So we just got done talking about an arterial roadway, but uh, most of our neighborhoods have a collector. So in Charleswood, it's 17th Avenue. Um, in Shadowwood, it's 4th Avenue. In the Eagle Run, it's 9th Street. Um, and in the wilds down here, it's 9th Street. Um, a sanitary lift station, a stormwater lift station, stormwater retention pond, so on and so forth. So uh, I bring that up because um, after this, the developer filed a petition for the Wilds 11th edition, um, we also did include, uh, the improvement do include both local and regional infrastructure. Uh, the one thing that is not included, which has been the case for all of the developments off the 52nd Avenue, is uh, the items related to the potable water, uh, which are financed by the Castro Water uh, Users District. There is a, with every time we do an improvement project, there's an agreement executed between Castro Water and the city, whereby the city 
they will um, design and install the infrastructure, but they will pay that bill. So we take that portion um, at the end of calculating the final cost, we'll take that portion and send an invoice directly to Castle Water. I do believe that they create their own district and levy an assessment, um, but I have no idea on the process and how they go about doing that, um, and nor um, is it my business to know, I guess. So I couldn't answer questions on that, but uh, I do want to make note that all the water main components are not, or basically are removed from the project costs. Uh, the regional improvements consisted of, so specifically for 1321, consisted of storm sewer trunk mains and retention ponds, multi-use paths, a collector roadway, and um, any applicable incidentals to those infrastructure components. So like we talked about with Sand Street, the attachments that are uh, behind this report here are going to include the district boundary, the resolution directing assessments to be levied, go through uh, the construction plans and any photos, and then get into uh, the draft benefit methodology, the draft assessment allocation map, with its, uh, and then also a, a draft assessment list. Again, this will be pretty much repeated in every item. There is a special assessment policy adopted in September of 2016. Um, here in the financial summary, you can see that it was a little over $700,000 was the water main portion of work, again, directly financed by Castro Water Users District. So the amount to be assessed on this project is $4,945,000. And like the previous item, I conclude with um, just a, a historical uh, summary of, of some of the, not only the city actions that have taken place, but any of the, anytime there's public outreach or public involvement, trying to highlight that a little differently. Um, back in September, the city accepted the petition and created the approved creation of the district. In January of 19, the city approved an engineer's report. And the uh, estimated cost on that report was identified at a little over $4.2 million. And at that time, the city commission also um, directed, we had some, this is when we had turnover in commission and the new commission uh, really felt that it was important to reach out. Even though these are developing neighborhoods, they wanted uh, staff to reach out to the neighborhood. And uh, in this case, we actually sent out a letter and held a neighborhood meeting uh, where uh, we had the developer available to um, lay out the, the plans for not only what's taking place currently, but what their future um, objectives would be for the, the again, this is a master plan development over the course of um, many phases. So key point here is we did try to know, we, we notified everybody in this district and so um, and invited them to a neighborhood meeting and, and again so the purpose there was to make it well known that there are improvements being made by which um, regional infrastructure will be installed and they will be included in the assessments. After that, the final plans were approved in April. Construction uh, or uh, construction contracts were awarded in May. The uh, project cost there nearly five and a half million, and then of course um, that includes the seven hundred thousand dollars of gas for water work. Ultimately, then the final cost after construction was complete and completed um, in 2020 here. The amount to be assessed is four point or four million nine hundred forty-five thousand. Okay. So, any questions on the summary report before we move on to going through the, the construction photos? Okay. Uh, get right into that then. Here's the improvement district boundary. Again, everything south of Fifty Second Avenue, all the property was included. Now, this neighborhood uh, is bound by the city of Horace on the east and south uh, side here. So it's everything within the city of West Fargo limits, all of our property, which again um, is pretty much the entire neighborhood. There's a resolution directing assessments we levied. And after that here, now we get into the sample construction plans. 
some difficult to gauge here, but I do want to point out that the majority of the improvements are in the 11th edition, which is the, on the northwest side or northwest corner of this district. So you can see again, highlighted in red is where the majority of the improvements took place. So these next uh, couple of sheets here just provide a, a closer look at, you know, if you want to see where the utilities are being routed, you can see that detail in this attachment here. Uh, you can see here there's work being done on the retention ponds, so on and so forth. There's a lot of not only underground work, but uh, mass braiding that takes place, <clears throat> along with, of course, the uh, street improvements that are made. You're getting into the aerials. This is towards the end of the completion. You really should see that neighborhood taking shape. Here's a photo um, as they're installing storm sewer drains. And of course, the finished product here. So I went back to that a little quicker. Any questions on the scope of work again? What the con construction consisted of, what these improvements are for? If not, then I will move on to the draft methodology report here.
person that worked for a fence from that unit. Um, I think, you know, again, going through all of that, I will probably should have done this a little sooner. I don't want to <laughs> take too long here, but this map here, pretty much everything up here in this report is shown graphically in this, in this map. So um, I can certainly go through item by item as I was doing, or I can uh, move on to here. But either way, I think uh, I'm going to pause just for questions on the, the benefit methodology. So when I say the benefit methodology, again, how we're tracking all these buckets. You know, when I was talking about Cheyenne Street and how we just had the one bucket, here's now a project with a multitude of buckets that we're tracking individually and assessing accordingly. And so you can see here, um, I'm going to just pick on this orange boundary here. There were improvements necessary due to the developer coming in and replatting a block here or a group of lots here. Uh, things like we had to shift over a service because that we already installed it. But when they replatted the five lots together, we had to go and relocate certain things. Mailbox was gotten away. No, so to accommodate replatting, uh, we tracked those costs and we assessed the, the properties that had a direct um, benefit from those improvements. So again, just trying to point out the, an example of how we are um, managing multiple buckets here and allocating according as uh, close to our policy as we can, but this is where um, some districts present new situations that aren't spelled out in the policy. So something like that where there's replatting of, of a block and we have to relocate some service lines. That level of detail is not necessarily in our um, special assessment policy. So at that point, it becomes more of the engineer's subjective um, uh, proposal on how to allocate that. And, and again, here, for this case, it's on an equivalent unit basis over these properties here. Not to the entire district, but to those properties identified by that yellow or that orange boundary. So, again, yeah, I'm going to now pause and ask if there are any specific questions relating to how we're tracking multiple buckets here and how we're allocating those assessments. If not, then I would move to the allocation map. Again, this is meant to be visible representation. Uh, I should have pointed this out with Sandry, but there is a disclaimer down here. Uh, you know, this is, this is a map created using preliminary data, and it's only intended as a visual aid for general reviewing purposes. So, point being, um, you know, if there's a resident, for example, watching this, and they see that their property is, you know, this one listed at $23,452. That may or, you know, that, that might not be 100% accurate, but especially when we get through the discussion today, have to make any changes, so on and so forth. It is the published lists that go out after this meeting that are to be dependent on. So, but this does do a nice job of, of providing a quick representation of where the majority of the costs are. So again, uh, with the Wilds 11th edition uh, being where the bulk of the local improvements were made, that is why they are receiving the bulk of these special assessments. The properties outside of that local benefiting area, uh, here's an example out in here. Uh, again, after tallying all these different buckets, uh, these properties range anywhere from, you know, just shy of 1,000 to you know, a couple or 1,200 or so. There is a large unplatted parcel here. There's a couple of them actually, but um, this one has actually just recently been platted, that wild 21st edition. What we did do uh, with this is we did run a side calculation as if it were platted, determined what that would be for this entire area, for this entire parcel, and that is the dollar amount that we're proposing on this parcel. The alternative method to consider, and again, for our assessment policy, would be to treat an unplatted parcel as 
you assess on, you know, after all these calculations made with each bucket, you tally the total dollar amount up and then apply a 75% factor. Basically saying you um, take and apply a parcel, take the total assessment and reduce it by 25%. The philosophy there is that when a uh, property like that becomes platted and develops, they will dedicate um, roughly 25% of right-of-way park dedication, the, you know, the usable lot space will be reduced down to, say, 75%. So instead of doing it that way, we did run through and treat it as if it is already platted, which, again, that plot was approved a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's just not showing up in our materials yet today. So uh, by comparison, when we compare the 75% method versus the way we did it, the way we did it shows that um, the total area we actually is getting about a 72 or 3 percent factor. So we're pretty close to that 75 percent. But that's the, that's the important part to probably understand as the assessment commission is if we do it the way, you know, again, just focus that it's unplatted today and don't care that this meeting it was unplatted at 75 percent. Doing it the way we've done it to account for the 21st edition means it's actually getting assessed 72 or 3 percent. So the total dollar amount decreases by just a couple percent more. But I think that is the most fair way, especially since two weeks ago that plot was approved. Okay. Um, the uh, last thing I'll leave you with here is that there are, uh, you can see here, the, the properties that are not receiving an assessment, they're whited out and they have a zero on them. Predominantly they're retention ponds or you know, bike, bike path connections or this is a sign lot. So. With that, I'm going to pause and ask any questions. First one, pretty much the same philosophy we've done on the other districts out there for the allocation of the assessments, other than those few tweaks that you had for movements and services. But uh, the dollar assessments are about the same as the other districts out there, pretty close. Yeah, uh, yep, and they track, you know, when, whenever we do a, a delta like this, whether it be um, Neighborhood or Catawood, mm -hmm. the local improvements really have ranged anywhere from fifteen to $30,000, again, depending on lot size and the efficiency of the plot, if you will. Um, so the, the fact that the majorities are hitting at, you know, around 20 plus or minus is a quick uh, snapshot there. It's a quick smell test for me that, yep, this is shaking up where the local improvement costs
parties within the district, specifically because there are existing lots, again, within a regional boundary. And so we want to make sure that uh, those properties were notified that, hey, even though you're already living in a house and you're, you're fine and good, what you don't know is, you know, a few blocks away, we are expanding a stormwater retention pond or we're building a stormwater retention pond. Here's a letter um, that, you know, again, able to notify them accordingly. Here is the improvement district boundary. Eaglewood is, again, another mass plan um, development uh, through several different phases. It is located west of Cheyenne Street, north of 32nd Avenue. The yellow highlighted area represents the entire boundary. The red area represents where these local improvements were constructed. The resolution directing assessments related to total amount to be assessed, $2.45 million. And just a couple plan sheets. I'm going to go through those relatively quick. You can see here again, uh, storm sewer drains being installed. Like other, like the other development, there's going to be um, sewer water storm improvements along with the street paving. The regional work that was done is relating to the stormwater pond. So before I get into the methodology, any questions on the nature of the work that was done, the scope of the work? No? Okay, moving on. So the draft benefit methodology, the local benefiting area is the Eagle with 7th edition flat, as I showed you on that previous map, and the regional benefiting area is the entire district, that yellow shaded area I showed you. All of the local improvements that were assessed on a front foot basis are the sanitary sewer and water mains, the streets and, and the electrical components, such as the street lighting. The uh, storm sewer work was assessed on a square foot basis. And so I'd say, you know, between these two local items here, that is very consistent with a traditional residential neighborhood when we install improvements. The regional components, square foot basis, square foot basis um, they're, again, being a multi-phase development. There have been other retention ponds installed uh, in the area, and so the, the history of the prior ponds were assessed to the same regional boundary. So if there was a pond assessed a few blocks away, that was assessed to that same boundary. So we've been consistent in this neighborhood, is, um, in other words, what I'm trying to say. And there were uh, some costs associated with wetland mitigation. Um, the wetland mitigation in this particular project of course, um, unfortunately resulted in a project delay. If I went back to that summary sheet, you could see in chronological order there that we got to a point where we were approving plans, uh, but then had to put the project on delay. Actually, we awarded a construction contract, um, and shortly after doing so, we were notified um, that a portion of this development had a wetland on it, so we had to stop work actually for the entire season, go back and um, go through an extensive process with the Corps of Engineers to get those wetlands mitigated, which in this case meant we had to buy um, some of a, a wetland bank. You go to a, and when I say a bank, you know, an entity like a Ducks Unlimited has land throughout the area that are approved wetlands that you basically trade. Uh, we need two and a half acres in this case. They charge you $50,000 an acre. That cost that we paid is in this uh, district. So it's the first time that we've um, run into that. Actually, in 1321, the previous district had a little bit of that as well. And fortunately for that district, though, we didn't have a, a big delay, whereas this one did. Um, OK. So the corresponding map to that is as follows. So again, pretty Pretty simple. The local benefiting boundary is the Eaglewood 7th edition plot. This is where the um, developer filed a petition for improvements specifically for this area. However, because we had to construct a regional retention bond, there is an assessment spread over the other properties in the area. And again, the um, wetland mitigation component was specifically relating to the pond and and I know the question might come to head in mind. Couldn't you just use the pond as land? Nope. nope. We would spend more. 
more money than we bought a wetland bank trying to convert this into an acceptable wetland approved by the Corps of Engineers. So, is that the diversion ditch right to the west of that? Yes, mm -hmm. right back right to the diversion ditch. That's a huge wetland up there. <laughs> I can, is that the final? It, it, um, I can say it's an educational experience. Um, the developer was certainly brought in early on, and they were given an opportunity to, to pursue this privately. Um, I can spare the language that they were using at this point. But um, the developer has been around for years, and again, this being the first time that we've ever been. Um, well, that's, this is the last. Um, Eaglewood? Yes, this is really the, the, the culmination now of the Eaglewood development, which, you know, the Eaglewood development is, is south of 26th Avenue here. Primarily, all of this is, is Eagle. Eaglewood. Over here, this is an Eagle Run. If you look up the, the plat titles, this is Eagle Run, but um, everything from 32nd, I would consider this all part of the Eaglewood development. Um, and when it comes to the stormwater retention, the stormwater lift station that is here right along Shine Street, just south of 26, as well as all of the retention ponds that are in here, this is all one service area. It's everything from the diversion to Shine Street from 26 to 30 so even though the plot does change names once you get to the southeast corner, it's all part of the same area. Um, the, the pond cost is specific to this boundary, though, even though this all that entire, so if it, as I pointed out, you might be wondering why, why are these portions not included in the boundary then? They paid for their retention systems as isolated, you know, in an isolated district. So we, we looked at the previous ponds that were assessed over this boundary, or the, the ones right in here, or I should say this particular one here. So we used the same boundary as we constructed this pond. Okay, uh, moving into now the allocation map. Here's the scale. So the regional properties, residential properties, in here now, you can see the assessments are ranging anywhere from $600 to $1,000, lower $1,000, depending on the size of the lot. And predominantly, that was, uh, you know, on an area basis. As for the local improvements, as I mentioned with 1321, when I see local improvements anywhere from fifteen dollars to $30,000, that tells me that it's, for the most part, passing what I consider a small test. Albeit some costs in here a little higher. Uh, some, again, every development has nuances, every project has nuances. The nuance in this particular one might be uh, very related to the fact that it's the last one to come in. So as the, as the last one to come in, there's already an existing special assessment balance on this, on platted parcel. When it's platted, that, that existing balance gets redistributed over these parcels, and it shakes out the way it shakes out. And if they... Um, and that, that's where some of these things can, subdivision by subdivision can certainly fluctuate depending on the timing and plotting and all that, all that stuff. So, but just to answer the question before you ask it, I'd say that this is, a, it, it passed my spell test anyway of, of what a local improvement would cost. And after that here is the, the list. Let's get to the last sheet on that list. Okay, after the, the list here, it always includes an allocation summary again. So you can see how each of the buckets, the total cost and the, the cost per method. So here's the cost for the front foot. Here's the cost per square foot, um, so on and so forth. Storm sewer cost per square foot, 50 cents. Um, this project also did include a development development hookup fee. All newly platted areas um, are charged a hookup fee for the sewer. Uh, it's something that was put in place when we developed when we started developing South Interstate to help finance the regional infrastructure, things like the, the really big sanitary sewer station that was installed early on to to uh, serve all of the development uh, south of the interstate. So, okay, with that, I'm gonna stop and ask for questions.
that even should be. And then that's, again, where I, I feel like the Special Assessment Commission can, can weigh in. And so just like this one, by the way, I will point out, so if you look on the other side here in blue, there is the properties. Properties here have kind of the opposite effect, a larger rear yard property line than, than front yard. But again, we, we do take that 25-foot setback and use that particular number when we are doing the, the front footage calculations. But again, as you can see, that's where each plot, each neighborhood, each, each district, each project, everything can have its own little nuance. And so what started as I considered an easy district, I just made it a little bit more challenging because of two properties. But, um, and that's where I'll let you guys kind of take that discussion where you want to take it. Yeah. I mean, the $42,000 lot is double over the other ones. I mean, yeah. That's, so so it, it, does, it doesn't seem appropriate. Right. Only all the same size would you consider it's a budget. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the past, have we put a cap maybe on those two, Jim? Have we, we put a cap on it? Well. Yeah. yeah, because the town, you know, equalized vote. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of it came from discussions with the developers who said, <clears throat> is there something we can do because of the irregular shape of the lot? You know, I still have to sell it. Mm -hmm. uh, that was kind of, we went to the assessment commission and said, okay, guys, look at this. It's, it's really no different than the other lots. Mm -hmm. It's just a weird shape. Sorry to interrupt, commissioners. Just want to point out that all of the lots in here are built on. Well, they are. I don't know who owns this particular lot. Um, not that, that matters. But then it's not a developer question. Anyway. I, yeah, I, I honestly, I just I don't know who owns that particular lot. But I would. Uh, this is also now the process here. Whatever decision you do make, uh, our next step in this is to not only advertise the list in the legal section of the paper. But we will send out letters to every, um, every property with every district. And so they will be notified of what their assessment is. And um, you know, everyone treats their mail a little differently. But if I were to receive that particular notice that I've got 32,000 of assessments, I might ask my neighbor. And when I see that they got half of it, I might come here and object. And that's, that's the process. <laughs> Can you go back to the picture of the home? I guess just, just from my, my position, it doesn't look like the homes in those lots are particularly larger, more uh, more value than the other homes. Sometimes you'll see corner lots being more desirable in the development. Mm -hmm. That kind of looks like they just tried to stuff, the, yep. stuff as many homes on that development as possible. Not that that's a bad thing. We encourage density. We encourage efficiency, and it was just probably unavoidable here. To your point, it looks like the same square footage of the ones inside as uh, the corners. Yeah. It's really taking I could try to equalize the pizza. Yeah, I think that's probably mm -hmm. the best thing we could do. Uh, so what, what do we think, gentlemen? On this side of the lot, try to equalize those assessments out? Yeah, no, I, don't, I don't think you go exactly equal because then we should be doing that for all the rest of the development. So that's what I was thinking a cap might make sense. So if we take a look at the numbers again per lot, Dustin, and come up with, all right, so we've got 25 and 20, okay, so 26,075 is the highest that we have there. Maybe we have that as a cap and then the difference we can allocate to the rest of the development or just the lots in between there. Just an idea. Yeah. That, that I've seen that. I've seen Homestead Corp, for example. They just they said, look, this is there's some goofy shaped lots. We're just going to take the entire cost and divide it by the number of people. So I mean, you could go to that. We could do away with everything I've showed you here and, and the front foot and square foot and all that stuff. And they basically took the total cost and divided it by the number of lots. But um, I'd say the only time I can think of that was Homestead Corp. I, I certainly agree. We could take a look at capping it at, at a, a number and then redistributing it over all properties. Um, There's also some twin homes. So we have some single family and some twin homes in here too. So right. I don't know if it's an equal distribution throughout. It's fair either. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm 
mean, I think cap would be, be nice. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of townhomes, so, you know, there's a good point there. So I, I feel like, you know, I don't necessarily want to limit it to just those six properties, but I feel like that's kind of probably going to be the most fair thing right. to do. figure we're going to come up with a figure, but let's say 30,000, then whatever is over, that's going to be redistributed against all the lots? That would be, I'd certainly say one way to do it. I would certainly agree with that. So it's really the only good fact that I can see is two lots? Mm -hmm. So if, just to clarify one question I would have is if, if you're talking capping, you're talking finding like the, you know, the most the assessment on a lot is 26,000, is that and the difference the Japanese at the 26,000, for example, would um, yield 14, uh, um, and so 23,000 dollars would then be redistributed over all properties, including those. So, and that, is that what I'm understanding? Mm -hmm. This 26,075 is where. Yeah, there's a higher one, the 26,836. But yeah, I just, I just, I just did some quick math and just took the numbers that are shown here and just added them up five by six or like 27,800 rounding up. So, I mean, if we were to, assuming there's, you know, same square footage, you know, if we were to average it out, it wouldn't be that much more than what that 26,801 is. Which, I mean, based on this picture, it looks like these lots, these six lots are bigger than any of the other ones. Unless, you know, at least the rectangle ones. Okay, so for the lots in red there, we'll make a motion to put the cap at the 26846 and then redistribute the difference between those two lots up to the rest of the development. Is that your motion? Yeah. Okay. I'll second that. Okay. Second, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, motion carried. Did you... I followed that, yeah. You followed the motion, okay. Uh, Kayla, our engineering office manager, is, I can see, writing a lot of stuff down, so I'm sure she captured it or I did. And we are recording this, so we can always go back and yep. take a look. Um, well, I, I apologize, commissioners, for putting you in that situation, but honestly, I feel like that is the epitome of where your role comes into play. So, I appreciate your... And with your permission, I will move on then to District 1325. And again, this district is really just consisting of local infrastructure. So as you can see here, the improvement district boundary is very small um, to this local and to that localized area. This is the Oak Ridge 18th edition plot. The amount to be assessed is 925000 um, I believe the Park District had a contribution here for some improvements that were made. Um, getting into construction here, you can see just a review of the improvements that were brought into. Uh, this is a, you know, similar to the last plot. This is predominantly um, twin home type development very, very dense. Um, and it's, I don't know if it's the third or fourth phase uh, in this particular neighborhood, but it is a continuation of master plan development that is located. It, this is southwest of, of cash-wise, if you're, okay. we didn't pause long enough on that improvement district map. But this is a couple blocks south of 32nd Avenue, um, west of, of cash-wise, west of 6th Street. So, this is 6th Street. This right here, this building that I'm trying to hurt, uh, circle around with the cursor here is um, Rudis Brick House. Okay. Sorry, I have to use a establishment like that. To <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, I know where it 
Is yeah, everybody on uh, everyone? Yeah, yep. Uh, the next couple of slides are utility underground work. Uh, here's some paving being done out here. Um, again, scrolling relatively fast through that. I know I've already taken up over, um, coming up in two hours here. So I'm trying to be as brief as I can, but let me know if you need more detail. Uh, the methodologies, there are some lots in here that were not assessed. I'll show you that on the, on the maps. Otherwise, um, unlike previous subdivisions um, for those districts, this particular district, if you noticed, is nothing but out of shape. And so uh, we felt like uh, what we would propose to the assessment commission, other than the, rather than the traditional front foot for sewer water and streets, square foot for storm, let's just do everything on a square foot basis here, uh, simulating that. Um, it's somewhat of a per user method, but at the same time, it will also um, carry through the, the consequence of having a larger lot versus a smaller lot. And so we'll, again, we'll see that with the maps. So not much to show in the benefit methodology map. Uh, again, it's all local benefit. Um, but now here in the allocation map, again, you can see uh, some discrepancies um, between the parcels and uh, like before, I, um, I erred on letting it shake out on the square foot basis. I think we did some adjustments here and there, but for the most part, this is really shaking out based on that um, methodology. And I'd say again, here is a, a situation where the assessment commission can, can weigh in. I don't quite recall the use of these properties, but I want to say that um, I believe some of these might have multiple dwelling on it. Is that not right? That, so this, this larger one, this one doesn't have, say, a multi yeah, okay. Just a bigger lot. Okay. And I do recall that some of this area was replatted according to what looked like in this gray boundary to the east of it. It used to look like that. They replatted it into something more like this. Um, so there was an intention there with the plot, but again, that there's a consequence when it, when it comes to allocating out the assessments. And that's where maybe square foot isn't the right way. Maybe um, there's other things to consider, but front foot would still have the same type of nuance. And when it comes to the type of improvements now, predominantly the sewer water um, infrastructure that's associated with this and, the, and their streets, you know, it's sewer water, you can easily see where it's one user, the street, kind of the same thing. The storm water, I would certainly caution that storm water does depend upon the area. You know, so the bigger the lot, the more previous it is, the more drainage is suiting to our system. Um, but just like our previous conversations when it comes to trying to figure out who's using the street more than the other, who's flushing the toilet more than the other, it's at that point. Um, our policy has been front feet, and we can certainly go back to that, but I thought with such an irregular shaped uh, plot to just start with the square foot assessment and see where it goes from there. What's that zero assessment plot? That's part of a park district parcel where there is a bike path that was connected or a six foot wide sidewalk, I believe, and you can't see it on here, but there is a private retention pond in here. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, there, there was a sidewalk connected from 4th Street, which you see on the left side of the map, all the way into this neighborhood. And that's where the Park District funded that component. And that's the type of lot that we would, um, it, it's not going to be taxed, so we are not assessing or allocating an assessment to it. Yeah, absolutely. Welcome our Assistant City Administrator. I don't want to step in too much on your decision making here. I just want to note that all of the residential property which are on 34th Way East, those are all um, connected townhomes. Some on the south side are like these fourplex ranch level, and some on the north side are multi-level. They're all connected, and some of those ones that have a larger lot actually have portions of the private roadway on them, and, and so that might weigh in on your decision making. I just want to clarify that. In those uh, involved in that on the planning side. So.
Nope, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, that would seem inappropriate to have in 
this in this type of development, it's like a townhome development. Everybody's kind of got their own little piece. Now, nobody has not like the last example where some people have different sized lots. They all sort of have their own piece, and then they share common space among them. So our improvement district here was requested of our engineering department by the developer to put in the sewer and the water, and then they put in. Oh, we do the road too, yeah. So. I guess what I'm getting at is the same thing on the other one. Mm -hmm. The lot 50,000 is a whole lot different other than it's just a weird shaped lot. Mm -hmm. It's got a similar home on it. It's, just, it's similar to the other ones. I'm just going to show you this table down here if you're curious as to where the costs were. 400, 420,000 for street, 380 for sewer water, 120 for storm. Um, one thing we can certainly look at is if you can switch this out either to a front foot or maybe it's equivalent unit or maybe it's a user, you can certainly run the options. Um, what I don't have for you is what, what that would result in and how you would make a decision to move forward, I guess. But I think we're, where you were just going, if we were to look at gapping it again, um, that'd be consistent with the previous plot, and uh, the only challenge I'd say would be what, what's the cap amount, <clears throat> and maybe it's, to offer a suggestion, maybe it's the 29,000 here, you know, maybe 30,000, I've mentioned it a few times tonight, that 15 to 30 to me was, um, I guess, that smell test of local improvement assessment. So you could look at capping at 30,000, which would take all of the red lots, put them at 30, and redistribute the cost over everything else. Now, of course, that would jump this 29 up to a, I mean, it would hit a cap. So we would have to, there might be other lots here that would hit the 30. Um, what it certainly also does, though, is now this 15,000, where does that end up? And is that fair? And again, that's where And the, the lack of being able to have a black and white policy in these scenarios is just start somewhere and have a discussion. That's what we've always done in the past. It's start somewhere and have a discussion. I think all the time in the in some cases in the past I had a spreadsheet sitting here we could start playing with numbers. Um, and I just I don't have that available today. So either we come up with a motion similar like we do with the last district or I come back, table this one and we come back for a special meeting in a consistency of having a cap again, just like we did the last one. Yeah. It was either that or go to equivalent unit throughout the whole thing, which I don't think is fair because that's not being consistent with outside of for policy. Right. Yeah. Not be yeah. I like that cap deal. Yeah. It's me this guy's got more benefit from this from these products than anybody else does. Just a little heavy on their social business. Our cap number would be just either a little more expensive. I mean, probably because there's less lots come on, a little bit more than the other one. Yeah, I like the idea of 30,000, but if we're going to stay consistent, we should go with the highest, which would be that 29,028. Um, Your average is out per lot, you know, so if, assuming they are all the same and mm -hmm. everything would be just a little over 26,4, is what that number would be. Obviously, different sizes.
again, Commissioners, I really am hopeful that this next project here is going to be a little more straightforward. Um, I just caught my first error that I see here in the report. Uh, this does reference District 1321. In fact, I just told Jerry a few hours ago, I'm worried that I probably did that somewhere here. Uh, but we are talking 1329, which is for Eagle Run 9th edition. Um, <laughs> we've got the same attachments, the total cost here, 1.345, is what was established in the resolution making assessment we levied. This is only consisting of local improvements. This is a, a commercial development now, something similar, though, where there is an easement here with uh, utilities underneath, within the easement, and a access roadway. Um, the improvements, again, underground utilities, some street paving. So I'm going to try to get through the photos and the plans. And again, let me know if I need to double back to paint a better picture. And just like with the previous district, um, because of just the nuance, of, of this plat, uh, not really, front bridge doesn't really apply in this case when it's a private driveway bisecting the lots. And so, in proposing to assess everything on a square foot basis, but like I said during the last district, that has been a little more common for these commercial developments that are very similar to this. So, the cash wise area itself, um, we would have done that, I think, on a, on a square foot. I think that one has a square foot from the unit type stuff. But, um, point being is I, I feel comfortable that this is consistent, and now when I get to the, the map here, um, you know, the, you'll see there is a little bit of discrepancy, but that's purely because this is a, a larger lot. It does take up more of that driveway that comes through here, so um, and I, I don't know if I had a good, yeah, this will work. So, like I mentioned, this is the green hash area is where there is a common access roadway. It's not a traditional right away road, but it's for the most part the, the road through here, as well as uh, with the connection up to 32nd Avenue. So this property here, uh, which is already built upon, developed, um, they're receiving the brunt of the assessment because they're the largest lot. And uh, for me, I am comfortable with recommending the commission approve it on this basis. But here's where I will pause and, and see where you want to take the discussion, and I'll answer any questions. I mean, commercial, my opinion, in a commercial area, a larger lot is certainly more advantageous. Um, and chosen because it's a larger lot, and you know, the location to the street, so I'm comfortable with the way it's at. Yeah. I agree. I'm too. I'll make a motion to approve 1329. Yeah, Papers are done. Aye. Aye. Motion carried. All right, the next item was item 6 for 2250. We covered that item 1, so I'm going to jump to Street Improvement District 2254. And this is a street improvement uh, project that is just on the north side of the lights. It's in the Eagle Run Plaza 6th edition plat, but more commonly referred to as the, the lights development on the corner of 32nd and, and Cheyenne Street. Uh, so it is a local improvement assessed to uh, the few properties that are adjacent to this roadway that was put in. So you can see here the district boundary includes properties from 29th Avenue down to 32nd um, from Cheyenne to 5th, the exclusion being the, uh, this parcel here, which is our fire station, uh, which um, is really not accessing this, this roadway, whereas the uh, developers that filed the petition for this road to be paved are representing these parcels that are shaded in yellow. So the lights being on the south side of this roadway, uh, the parking ramp, I'm not sure that you're all familiar with, is adjacent right along this, the road that was put in. On the other side, there is a multi-use uh, commercial, and I think that it's a not multi, it's a mixed entertainment, mixed use development. And I believe that's how I worded it in that report up there. Anyway, you're, I think you're familiar with the area. The improvements were specifically for street paving. There were some storm drains installed as well. The total cost $300,000 was directed to be levied. There are plans. Again, just a street section. There are some, there were some parallel parking installed as well as a sidewalk on the south side. The 
developer on the north side requested that the parking lanes and sidewalks not be installed with the improvements, that they would install them privately. So you will see that that is a component that we tracked and allocated accordingly, which I am identifying here in the draft methodology. So the developer agreed that he would run 11th edition properties with privately installed parking lane and sidewalk on the north side of that street. Um, otherwise, all other work to be assessed on a square foot basis again. The properties in the, in the district, there is an exception there. There's one property uh, excluded. Here is the benefit methodology map. So all the properties in the green boundary assessed for all work except for the parking lane and sidewalk on the south side of the road. That was only assessed to this blue boundary, lot two, which is the road network and, and diagonal parking along or around the lights development. That is a city-owned lot. It is basically the equivalent of city right-of-way. It's just it's there to provide access in and around the lot, so we are not assessing that particular parcel. Here is the allocation map. Yes? I don't believe that the plaza area or the parking lot should be assessed either. The parking garage, those are city-owned properties, and they aren't to be assessed. Well, this in our agreement with the whole for the TIF and everything, not to assess those properties that the owners would bear the cost of the project. We assess them for 1314. I've, I've got it. So I'm being consistent with our previous district that was assessed last year, 1314. Um, I've got documentation that does. Yeah, but they, they shouldn't be assessed for some to the agreement. So. Okay. Yeah, we can certainly take that off. Um, it will certainly change the dollar amounts, but in terms of the allocation method being square foot, um, is that something that, would you want this table, do you think, or should we have them assessed on a square foot basis and just see how those numbers would shake out? You just reallocate those assessments to the other parcels. So, commissioners, if you're not to assess the parking ramp, or? Yep, yep, that's what our uh, city attorney and city administrator are informing me of. Um, I apologize. I, I guess I didn't have that correct. I'm going off how we assess 1314, which we might have to take a look at that district too, um, in which we did assess those, those two parcels. But if by agreement we're not to assess them, then the, the balance on that is, as you can see here, roughly here, or roughly $62,000. So that $62,000 um, we would have to redistribute. Now, a portion of that is for the sidewalk and parallel parking, which is only that the property is down here, and then another portion would be to the north. So I'd have to go back and, um, so maybe another way to look at it is here. The south parking lane and sidewalk accounts for $28,500. So I'd have to figure out of those city lots that are not to be assessed, how much of that is this work, and then how much of it is the other work, and then redistribute that accordingly. Does that make sense? So basically, the properties on the north side, I won't redistribute any costs relating to this 28500 That would be assessed back just to those two properties on the south side. But again, okay, if you assess it on the square foot basis, yes. so, and so if you take the square footage of those two off, and just can let it take out to where the rest of the numbers pop in it. Correct. Yep, we're going to take the square footage out, so the cost per square foot will change. I will still only assess the properties according to this methodology that we talked about, so this bucket over certain lots. Yep. So that, that's what we're proposing right now is to still approve based on assessing on a square foot basis, but that these two properties in here will not be uh, receiving an assessment. So I will take where it says in here the area factor. Mm -hmm. See how lot that lot two identified having a zero. I will zero out the other two uh, city West Fargo parcels.
So again, uh, at, at this point, I'm asking to still approve the allocation method. So we're allocating these costs on a square foot basis. What's changing right now is that uh, the city parcels within this district are going to be zeroed out. Right. So that's so we're clear. It's done by an agreement, not that the special assessment commission is just not assessing a city property because they are subject to assessment. It's done because there's agreement with the city and the property owners that says that. So that's the reason we're reserving them all. Right, because with the TIF agreement, the property owners end up paying for it anyway. So the property owners in that development. Okay. We could approve just with that, and then the numbers will shake up. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do you make it definitive, or do you want to contingent upon confirming the agreement? Uh, it, 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 they're not supposed to be assessed because they have no revenue generating capacity. Yeah, okay. So, so it would be definitive for zeroing these out. Okay. We're going to go ahead and approve it on the square foot basis. And, you know, I'll move to approve. Uh, 2254. Do you think that's an awkward basis? I'll move second. All in favor say aye. 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 Um, motion carries. All right. Well, thank you for that again. And moving on to the very last one here. Storm Sewer Improvement District 4063. This is back to that wild neighborhood. This is for the uh, 463 is specifically for the storm water pumping station that was installed, uh, which benefits the entire neighborhood south of 52nd. Um, so even though there is a lot of discussion in here, some of this discussion I do uh, identify why we would put in uh, storm water stations and retention ponds. Um, it's part of our policies and responsibilities operating a, a municipal storm uh, system. So uh, following not only our state Department of, our Department of Environmental Quality Standards, but also the EPA uh, guidelines, we are enforcing a stormwater management plan and, and policies. So that drives the need of the SWIFT station. This is a project that is technically not specifically petitioned for by a developer, but um, a developer petitioning for improvement to be extended into an area, uh, like I mentioned before, will generate the need for regional infrastructure. And so um, this one is specifically for the stormwater pumping station, which uh, you can see here. So now this district boundary map includes all the parcels south of 52nd between the diversion and the city of Horace. In the northwest corner, you can see here in this little shaded out area, this is the location of the pumping station. It's right off this retention pond. So the, all the ponds in here are interconnected and drain up to this uh, pumping station. And then it discharges water into the diversion. So one of the challenges with that is the time it takes to get the proper approvals. Uh, we coordinate this with the Southeast Gas Water Resource District and have to get necessary permits from the Corps of Engineers to be able to, to not only work in the diversion uh, right away, but also to discharge. So um, that's why there is a bit of a time delay between when the first couple, two, three phases are improved um, before we can actually get in here and get this lift station installed, which generally is okay because in the, in the early stages of a neighborhood like this on 300 acres, you can generally get by with the, the first few getting developed before you really need to start pumping out the water. There's enough undeveloped land to hold the water. So here's an aerial overview. Again, here's the, the station site itself. So it's taking water off this pond system, this pond network, and discharging it into the diversion. There is an outfall structure that was installed in the um, levee bank. You can see here's the foundation um, excavated out for the, the building. Here's the, the walls being framed and then installed. Here's on the surface what the end product looks like. Here's the force main being installed and the outfall structure. So this is where you can see how it discharges into the diversion. So 
similar to the District 1321 uh, Wild 11th project, we had a handful of lots that we are not assessing, uh, that we did not assess in that district. We are, those same lots are not being assessed with this project. Uh, this is now instead of 100% local, this is 100% of regional projects. So there are no local components. It's all assessed on a square foot basis. Uh, the only two items that we really track were the storm sewer lift station cost itself, and then of course there were costs associated with getting the necessary permits from the Corps of Engineers. Here is the Bennett methodology map. Now here is the allocation map. The item I'd point out is that, again, here are city-owned lots. These are the retention ponds for the most part that are not being assessed. Uh, one down here, I believe, is where there is a um, storm trunk main that's connected in through here. Uh, there also might be, a, I think, that's also where a bike path is connected in through there. Um, there is, so with all of this neighborhood, there is one parcel here that has yet to, to develop. It is an existing homestead. Um, they've been assessed with all the other improvements. Um, and no difference they're being assessed for this improvement district. Uh, you know, the development has been occurring in basically the backyard for the last several years, so it, um, they are aware of districts, but I don't know, um, you know, once we send out the letters with a specific amount, will be when they realize that for this district it's this amount. Um, I didn't mention that with 1321, I guess it just escaped my mind, but again, they were assessed for 1321 too, I don't recall what it was, but it's, it's um, in our policy that even though they're an existing home set, you know, they uh, are receiving benefits from these improvements, so they are assessed according uh, as close to our policy as we can. So here is the range. Um, for the most part, single-family homes are uh, ranging anywhere from, you, know, you can see on the map here, $1,500 up to $2,500. Again, it's all square foot basis. Um, you can see where the bigger lots then end up with more assessment. And you do end up with a lot like this where it is three times the assessment of some of the other lots. But the benefit of the storm system is specifically relating to the size of the property. The one thing that does also impact it is the impervious percentage of the property. So if the property has a lot more rooftop and driveway, um, that plays a role, but as far as, as long as I've been doing this, we've really only looked at the area, not necessarily again the individual uses of the individual properties. So, so that I will pause and ask for questions. I'll zoom through the list here and get to the, you know, at the end of the day, really just, there were costs associated with the permits, but really just track it all as a square foot basis because no point in identifying two items in here. They're both on square foot. It's just, so I combined it all into a single item. And the, the total cost here now is 36 cents a square foot. That has been more common with storm sewer lift stations. Um, I believe this mission was around when we did a previous storm lift station that was much lower rate, but uh, different scenario, different situation. So that's where, for the most part, I would say this matches other stormwater lift stations in terms of what the residential assessments equate to be. And it, um, you know, a few years ago, I prepared a memo and identified through a number, I think about five or six different districts, the ranges were anywhere from 25 cents to 50 cents a square foot for a stormwater lift station like this, uh, with the exception of a district that was approved a few years ago. So this would have been put in at the time <clears throat> the first development went in, and the cost would be the same. The assessments would be basically the same. We would assess it on a square foot basis, then we're just doing it a little later because it's getting filled up. Yep, the only thing that would change would be um, the bidding environment of that year. You know, all the, the design would have been exactly the same, so it just would have been a matter of materials. You know, as we know, lumber, for example, has tripled in the last year, so um, luckily we got this before that, but yeah, that would be, so I wouldn't say it would be the same if it went day one, but it would have been the same methodology, absolutely. Okay. That homestead property that's all connected to all this, right? They don't do any... Mm -hmm. Yep, they have the ability to, um, all the infrastructure is brought up to their property, if you will. So, um, don't know if it will, if it will redevelop someday. Uh, we've seen that typically uh, in other neighborhoods where there have been five to anywhere from five acre to 30 acre type existing homestead. They traditionally redeveloped and the infrastructure is in place for them to, to 
do that, and it's also a place for them to use it now as a single family home if they want to. Okay. The large unplatted portion, does that get discounted 25% as well, or does it not because we're on a square foot basis? Thank you, Commissioner Shealy, for bringing that up. So just like the District 1321, we treated this area as if it were platted. As I mentioned earlier, the Wild 21st Edition was recently approved, and so we ran, even though those parcels have not been created yet, so the parcels aren't in our system to generate an assessment to, but uh, we basically did it outside of the system, calculated what the assessments would be as if the parcels were in here uh, for the 21st Edition, took that total dollar amount and entered it in here, and again, it, it's that 72 to 73 percent is what it works out to be instead of using a 75 percent reduction or a 75 percent factor. Another way to say that is instead of a 25 percent reduction, we reduced it by effectively 27 to 20 percent. Then how many acres on that homestead? Where is the single home on the 70,000? I want to say there are roughly five, six acres. Okay. I don't know off the top of my head. Anybody else knows that number off the top of their head, but I'm going to say six ish. Probably any other questions? I'm good. Make a motion to approve 4063. I will second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Motion carried. All right. Well, that uh, concludes all the information I want to provide to you. I again just reiterate that the next step in the process now is to publish the lists in the legal section of the paper. Um, and then again, we will distribute a letter to every resident within every district. Notifying them not only of the proposed assessment amount, but the time and date or time place of the public hearing in which they will have opportunity to uh, make an objection to their individual assessment. So, and that next meeting is scheduled for July 12th. Okay. All right. With that, okay with that.